Uh, welcome to today's Donders lecture. Um, of course, Professor Linda Smith does not need an introduction, but for the newcomers, new students in the field, uh, Linda Smith is currently a distinguished chancellor professor in psychology and brain sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. In her successful career, she has received many distinguished titles and awards. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a Rommel Hart, Rommel Hart Prize winner from Cognitive Science Society. She has received the APS Willem James Fellow Award and Norman Anderson Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Experimental Psychologists, among many others. She's leading the Cognitive Development Lab at Indiana University. So why did Linda get all these awards? Linda's uh, research has opened new perspectives in the field of infant development, especially in areas of cognitive and language development and word learning from a dynamic systems framework, grounding cognitive and language development in sensory motor dynamics of infants in their natural living habitat, visual and cross-situational learning, action processing, and object recognition and the intricate interfaces between them. In addition to her theoretical contributions, she has found new techniques such as using head-mounted cameras and eye tracking for collecting data from infants during their interactions in the world. And recently, she has been using and developing techniques such as embodied AI and robotics to shed further light into our understanding of human development and cognition. So I'm again very honored and very pleased that Linda is giving this talk in spite of all the challenges we face today as well as we are facing in the next months. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Linda if she is ready to go. Right, Linda? I am ready. Can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. One more thing. Uh, please uh, keep your questions in the chat at the end. I will read your question from the chat to Linda. Thank you very much. Okay, I am. Uh, will somebody just answer back that they can hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So, um, Thank you for having me. And I have to say, I've had a delightful morning talking to people um, at Donders. And I am sorry we're a little delayed, but we got it figured out. So there we are. All right. So learning, adaptive, intelligent change in response to experience is a core property of, um, I got to just do one thing for a minute here. I got confused. All right. All right, there we are. All right, learning, adaptive change in response to experience is a core property of human cognition and a long sought goal of artificial intelligence. And I just wanna begin with this point that I think that any theory or attempt to build intelligent devices needs to have something to say about how infants learn all that they do in the first two years of postnatal life. Infants begin with many immaturities and they rapidly learn to do a lot of things, to recognize faces, to read, to make specific, to reach to make specific toys, make specific sounds, to control their bodies, to actively explore the world, ultimately to imagine and make up their own stories and narratives. Clearly there's something very fundamental to understanding learning in how infants learn. I wanna uh, start with two examples that have been um, of particular interest to uh, both theorists of human learning and to um, theorists of our researchers in artificial intelligence. One is face recognition. Humans' face recognition ability is absolutely remarkable. We can recognize and discriminate thousands of faces. And by the time a child, not an infant, but by the time a child is two or three years old, they can learn to recognize a face in pretty much one shot. 
let's say Uncle Harry comes to visit for a family reunion and uh, child, the three-year-old's never seen Harry before. It's likely from that one experience, that one family reunion, that he will recognize Uncle Harry, even if he gets a little bald or even if he grows a mustache, maybe even from an old picture 10 years prior to the meeting, okay? We do this all the time and young children do it all the time. Rapid and robust learners from minimal data. They also do it for categories. If you were to have a two-year-old and they were to see, they have to be a city living child, of course, if they were to see their very first tractor for the first time, watch it work in a field and are told it's a tractor, they would, from that day forward, recognize all varieties of tractors, antique tractors, toy tractors, pictures of tractors, pretty much in the same way that adults do. And they wouldn't include cars or trucks or other forms of vehicles in the category. So how do we explain this? How are they doing it? Okay. Well, one thing we know is that both of these abilities, face recognition and one-shot object category learning, which again, children don't show at first, but show about their time, begin to show about the time they're two or three years of age, are experience dependent, that's a phrase we use for faces, or straight out learn is the word we use for tractors. They learn to do this. Question is, how do they learn it? What is the nature of the learning? Well, to explain any learning or experience dependent phenomenon, I think we have to understand both the learning machinery and the training data. Everybody concentrates on the learning machinery, but it is the training data that defines the task to be solved. And it is the training data that constrains the knowledge to be learned. The learning machinery has to match the task to be solved, which is training data. And it has to be able to find the relevant regularities in that data. So what I'm gonna concentrate on in this talk and really what I'm thinking most about most of the time now is what is the structure of the data from which children learn all they do and what does that imply about the possible learning machinery? And I'm going to be talking about um, work we've been doing for, oh, over 12 years now, trying to capture the everyday learning environments of infants. We do it in a variety of ways, um, what we call the multi-sensory project, which is with Chen Yu, in which we record uh, infant and parent interactions in high resolution, but naturalistic context, we have everybody wired up. That's what makes it high resolution and makes you maybe think maybe not quite naturalistic. And then we also um, collect data in, a, in the lab where we have a little bit of control, but in more free flowing cluttered play situations where people are not so wired up. And then we also collect data in what I'm gonna talk about mostly today. I'm gonna to be concentrating on what we call the home view and the India view projects. These are uh, where we put head cameras on uh, babies from one, uh, one month to uh, two years of age. And we try to get day long recordings of their everyday visual experiences. And that project, the Homeview project is, um, uh, it has a total of 101 infants from the U.S. in it and 50 infants from India. Um, and I just gave you the ages. We have well over 800 hours of video. And one thing you should know is unlike many day-long recordings, parents were told we were interested in vision and visual experiences and that all in any awake experience was of interest. There was no hint of any kind that we were interested in language or that we were interested in um, parent interactions with infants. And in fact, the beginning reason for doing this was strictly about vision, okay? So it's everything in a day, pretty much. So I want to just a little background for those who haven't thought of it. We use head cameras on babies to capture the data at home. Um, at the top here are shown some head camera images. And why do we use head camera images? Why don't we just go around and record what's in people's houses? 
Well, your egocentric view, the first person view, which is shown down in the corner in the little drawing, is highly selective. So that baby there, their field of view is pretty much the objects that are in color in that little square being captured by the head camera in the drawing. And unless that baby turns their head, shifts their posture, they are not seeing the crib or the dog or the train or the window or their mom. Now, of course, they could turn their head. But if babies are biased in terms of posture, biased in terms of their sensory motor abilities, biased in terms of their visual interests, biased in terms of their general interests, then everything that is in the room may not actually be in the child's view. So if you want to talk about the statistics of the visual environment, you can't just run around and take pictures of people's houses. You've got to look at what's in the image, in the first person view of the infant. And that's what we try to capture with head cameras. The other thing I want you to note is that's what these uh, heat maps are about. Everybody, and the data on this is quite good, from two weeks of age, all through their entire life, primarily looks at things in the world with the head and eye aligned. And what that means is when you're collecting 60, 80,000 images, even though there might be an occasional 500 milliseconds where the eye and the head are not aligned, most of the time you can be pretty sure that what's in the center of a head camera image is actually in the center of the child's field of view. All right, so what I want to do in this talk is just cover what I think are some of the bigger insights that uh, we have discovered from this work. And the first highlight is um, that the data for visual learning changes markedly over the first two years of life. It changes with every advance in the child's motor abilities. And because motor development, the order of motor development, reaching, sitting, crawling, standing, increasing skill with the hands, because the order of motor development is really tightly constrained, that these changes in sensory motor development create a curriculum, an ordered curriculum of visual experiences. So I just want to show you, this is a, a whole collection of uh, head camera images sampled at one every uh, five seconds. The, on the farthest left are two sets of images from zero to three months old. We, don't, we can talk about those later if you want, but if you just look at the zero to three month olds, what do you see? You see a lot of walls and ceilings and faces. If you go and turn to the six to eight month olds, you see a lot of floors. That's because many of these infants are trying to crawl or are sitting on the floor and you see cluttered scenes. There's still some faces, but there's a lot of other stuff in there too. And then when you get up to the 11 to 12 month olds, these now look like recognizable scenes. They look like the kind of stuff you might go out and take a picture of. Okay. And so you can just from this quick look through these videos, you can see that what's in them is changing dramatically with the age of the child. Okay. The data for learning are changing. Oops, let's go down here. That'll work better. Okay. So one of the first things we did in these studies was we looked at faces and what we found faces in the image. This was our first publication from Home View here back in 2015. And what we showed is that the proportion of faces in view for infants declined pretty dramatically um, between one month and um, almost 12 months of age. Each of those dots is an individual child. And for this first study, we analyzed over 3,000 3, images sampled from each child. And what the data suggests, when I say it declines rapidly, you may say that line doesn't look so steep, but frames are time. Those youngest babies are seeing faces 15 minutes or more out of every hour. The older babies in these data are seeing faces about six minutes out of every hour. 15 minutes out of every hour is a lot of faces. Moreover, those faces tend to be close to the baby within two feet of the head camera. So the young babies are seeing a lot of faces and they're seeing a lot of close-up images of those faces. 
And those faces are principally for everybody, faces with frontal views. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay. Interestingly, in these early experiences, it's faces that decline with age, not people. Okay. So if we go and we code our images for any body part being in view, not just faces, we see that there are people in infants head camera images pretty much constantly at every age sampled. So it's faces that decline with age, not people in view. Indeed, Faces dominate early, but what dominates for older children are hands. So you have with development, when we look in these images from day long recordings, we see that a lot of faces in the images early and a lot of hands later. That is the data about people is changing. Faces dominate early, but hands go up to sometimes 15 to 20 minutes per hour okay, in older infants. Now, interestingly, at all ages, more than 70% of the hands in view are touching an object, okay? So the hands are not just waving in the air, they're manipulating, doing instrumental acts on objects. So what we have is the contents of visual experiences changes from being one that's dense with people information that is faces, and one that's dense with hands acting on objects. This is a big shift in what the visual experiences are about. And what I'd like to argue is that they are creating developmental niches for solving different kinds of visual learning problems. That first you learn about faces, and then later you learn about objects and what hands can do with objects. So, I'll first talk a bit more about faces. Highlight two, there are strong constraints on the data for learning within these niches. Strong constraints that ensure that infant environments have the critical experiences for learning about faces. So young babies, they need constant care. That puts people near them. Young babies like to look at what they can see and close up faces okay, present high contrast, highly visible information for the immature visual system. So babies look at faces and parents like babies to look at them so they stay close. In one attempt to try to figure out what the critical properties of these expectant experiences are, this was what motivated our India View project. If we wanna say something about what the experience, the expected experience is for faces in early development. We can't just look at one kind of human community. We have to see what's generalizable or relevant across different kinds of communities. So we have collected the data in Bloomington, Indiana, and we've collected data in an um, under-resourced fishing village near Chennai, India. And these are two very, very different communities. In the U, in the in Bloomington, the average size of a house is 200 square feet, and there are on average 2.5 people living in it. Um, uh, Electricity is good. Okay. In this village in Chennai, um, the average size of a house is um, about 250 square feet, and there is on average four people living in it. Most of the activities of families happen on the street, cooking, uh, work, okay, happen out in the street, um, not inside the houses, and electricity is uh, sketchy. All right, so these are two very different kinds of geographies, very different kinds of population densities, uh, very different kinds of physical structures. So what do face experiences look like in comparison across those two? Well, actually they look pretty similar. So uh, at the top of this figure, okay, I'm showing for the US in blue and for India in orange, the number of people in view. This is any body part in view. So the y-axis shows the minutes per hour, okay? 
And the dots, I just want to tell you something about the dots, and I can answer questions about this. These dots are not individual subjects. These dots are 30-minute segments, okay, um, from the 58 hours per country by age group. And the reason we do the data in terms of 30-minute segments is we have learned since 2015 that for large scale, massive data that are not normally distributed, this is a better way for making sampling uh, comparisons that are fair across um, uh, different ages, regions, and children. And if you want to know more about that, you can read the paper on the bottom that I've cited there. Um, so these dots are 30 minute segments drawn from the corpuses at a whole for infants from zero to five months and six to 10 months in the US and India. And if we look at any body part, are there people in view? What you can see is there are generally people in view for the children in the US and generally people in view for the children in, in India, although there is a reliable difference in India and increase with age as the babies are spending more time on the street. However, if you look at faces, you see the same results in both the US and India, despite the fact that India is more crowded than the US, little babies do not see more faces. They see approximately, there are no differences between countries. There is a difference with age in both the US and in the village in India, young babies see a lot of faces and older babies see fewer faces. And the density of the population or the sizes of the houses does not matter in that result, okay? Why is that the case? Because babies need, I think, because babies need care and there are parents up close to them or people up close to them caring for them, okay? It's also the case that for both the babies, the young babies in the US and the young babies in India, they see a high number of what you might call template faces faces with uh, two eyes that are up close. Okay. And those faces are uh, much more frequent for uh, the younger babies than the older babies in both India and in the US. So this is just a beginning four way, but it suggests that what we have is a sensitive period for face recognition that is tightly constrained in a variety of ways so that young babies are ensured of getting a high dosage of experiences of close template views of faces, two eyes in view. And we know from the literature that these effects, uh, that these experiences are early, that if you don't, that these early experiences are critical. That is, there is, is a sensitive period for mature face recognition that is disrupted by the lack of faces in the uh, first six months of life. That work comes from work with babies with uh, cataracts and also from children in who are institutionalized, um, the, some, some of the Romania and um, Bulgarian studies of, uh, Hungarian, I'm sorry, studies of institutionalized children. Okay, all right. So babies have early biases. We know from the experimental literature that they like looking at faces. I'll just go back one slide a minute. We know that from the literature that quite young babies are born liking looking at these face template things. They like looking at these face template things more than they like actually looking newborns at uh, faces, although they rapidly come to prefer the faces of their uh, people who are raising them. But there's been a lot of debate in the literature um, that's not resolved, and I'm not going to resolve it, about whether this interest in face template and up-close faces is really about faces or whether it is really about uh, the young infant's visual abilities, which acuity due to the immaturities on the front, on the front end side at the eye level, uh, limits acuity and makes really high contrast um, low spatial frequencies more visible to them. And one of our new results these are, is that we see in these same young babies um, a dramatic interest that you don't see elsewhere in high contrast 
low spatial frequency images. So these are images that don't seem the baby is just looking at lights or door edges. They are not very infrequent in um, older infants where young babies uh, under three months have nearly 10 minutes out of every hour of these high contrast, uh, low spatial frequency images that are about nothing, lights, wall edges. Older infants only have about two minutes out of every hour, okay? Where they happen to be looking at the edge of something. And we've been working um, at looking at the uh, low level statistical properties of these. And so, whoops, you can see in the image that the younger babies are seeing much more babies under three months. Their images have greater contrast and their images have a steeper slope that relates RMS contrast to um, spatial frequency, which just means that the energy is all mostly at the low spatial frequencies. Um, all right, so this is kind of interesting to me in that what these babies are getting, think of this, a baby under three months of age is getting 15 minutes out of every hour of up close faces and 10 minutes out of every hour of edges and walls and bright lights at the edges of things. That's 25 minutes out of every hour. That is a big, faces and these high contrast uh, experiences are a big, big part of these early exper visual experiences. What is this teaching the system? Well, every image, every moment of vision carries information pertinent to both low level and high level features. And these developments, bottom to top and top down are developing together. And I think that one of the open questions is for us to try to think about, not like ask questions like, is it really a uh, face preference or is it really a uh, high contrast, low spatial frequency preference, but to start thinking about the, the relation between and the correlations between bottom up properties and top down properties. I think that's a, a big and important question if we're gonna understand the development of the human visual system. All right, this moves us to highlight three, <laughs> that continuing on with this point, the sensory motor development creates different developmental niches that are really devoted to solving very different kinds of learning problems. And so I told you that early visual experience is dense with faces, later visual experience is dense with hands acting on objects. And so now we're going to move to the hands acting on objects. And I think this is a niche for learning to visually recognize objects, to form object categories, and to learn object names. What these kinds of hands-on objects experience provide the children with is rich data about individual's objects and categories of things. And this work is also happening. These are new data, but data I'm very excited about. Um, at the level of the lowest, you know, at the front end, bottom up level of vision, cortical vision at the level of V1. So what these figures are showing here, they are heat maps showing the median contrast, how much contrast adjacent, pic, you know, black to white um, at each pixel location in the, um, head camera image. And these are collapsed across about 60,000 images in each age group. So it's like a summary of the general low level statistics across many different images. And what you can see here is that with development, as you're moving towards your first birthday, contrast is becoming centered in the center of the field of view very, very systematic. It's sort of wandering there slowly. The four to six month olds are a little better than the seven to nine month olds, but the 10 to 12 month olds, the contrast is located in the center of the image. Now, how is this happening? Okay, why is it happening? It's happening because how these babies are moving their bodies and how well they can control their bodies. They are holding objects and looking at them, spend a lot of time holding and handling objects. And when they do that, those objects are in the center. They do it so the objects are in the center of their field of view. 
how they move their heads also plays a role, okay? I don't want to leave that out. It is playing a role. That is, they move their heads in ways to make what they're interested in in the center of their field of view. They move their bodies and their heads. Okay. This, so what they're giving themselves, you can go back a minute. What they're giving themselves is the 10 to 12 month olds is high quality in this image, visual information for learning. For all humans, you, me, everybody, Vision is easier and we learn better from and we detect things and we discriminate better when that information is highly visible. And what does it mean to be highly visible in vision? It means to have high contrast and low spatial frequencies. All right, so what I wanna show next is that these differences, these handling of objects and how uh, babies use their bodies plays a, plays a real role in higher level, higher level processes. It's not just about low level vision. So we asked whether the kinds of images that babies presented to themselves when they were interacting with objects influenced how well they could learn words, okay? So this is from the multi-sensory experiments in the lab, not from uh, the home view data. And what we did was we asked parents and children to come into the lab and to play with three objects at a time. Those objects had different names. Uh, the parents were familiarized with the names before the play session began and were asked to use them. The parents were not told that we were gonna test the children later for their uh, memory, for the mappings between those objects and their names, okay? And we did this study uh, twice, two independent studies replicating the, the phenomenon that I'm gonna tell you about. So after the parents and the children played with these objects together and the parents named them, we then tested the child and for their names, their knowledge of the name to object mappings. And how we did this was how we figured, and what we wanted to know was what were the visual properties of naming moments that supported learning. So what we did is after the child was tested for that individual child, we categorized each of the object name mappings as learned or not learned. You can think of those as in quotes. That is if they map the name to the object two out of two times, we, we said they'd learned it. If they didn't map the name to the object two out of two times, we said they didn't learn it. Okay, so we're separating things at least into better learned and not learned. And then we go back in and we look at what were the visual properties of the naming events for object names that the infant learned versus did not learn, okay? And um, these are the results. Um, some of you may have seen these before, but I'm gonna walk you through it, okay? What we've done here is on the left and right side, okay, we have the learn cases where the object name was learned versus unlearned. And what we're gonna do is look at the visual properties for the learned object versus the other potential reference, okay, in the scene. So if you look at the learned object, we measured the visual properties from when the object was named, that's at utterance, it's a little blurry there in the middle where it says time on the x-axis. And we measured those properties out to 10 seconds before the naming event and 10 seconds after the naming event. And what you can see is for object size, which is the image size of the object, that's going to be how, that's gonna be related to contrast and it's gonna be related to its spatial frequency. That little picture of the child holding the green object up close, that's one of these ones where you have all the good visual properties centered in the center, okay? And what you can see is that the object size of the named object, when it's learned, is much bigger than the object size of the competitors. When the object name was not learned, there's not such a big difference between the visual size of the target and the competitors. Similarly, when the child is, um, when the object name was learned, the child is putting that visual information, that good visual size, that high visibility by bringing the object close to them, they are putting it in the center 
of the field of view and distant from the objects that were not that the competitor objects okay and for the unlearned object names the differences between the competitor objects and the named object um, are less distinct. The other thing to notice is the length of time over which the differences, particularly in object size, but also in the overlap with center for the good instances when the object name was learned, okay? This is not an immediate event, not a co-occurrence at a tiny point in time between the name and a good visual event, but a long event that begins and ends before the actual naming, okay? The other point I wanna make is that this is a direct consequence of the toddler's body, okay? And how one-year-old sensory motor systems work, okay? So the body of the toddler is creating these data. We have shown in a variety of kinds of experiments that uh, learning object names, uh, in this context depends on head stability. They're more likely to learn the object name if they keep their head station relatively stable and still than if it's moving a lot. Why is that the case? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that it need the their learning system needs a temporally long three to four second advantage of the named referent over competitors for the name to stick. It's also related to holding behavior, although parents can create uh, naming moments where the visual information, there's one object foregrounded, big in the view and centered, just as well as infants do, shown in those two pictures in the right here. The parent ones are not as effective at, uh, they're, they're not as correlated with learning as child holding is. Now, why does child holding matter? It could be because the child's more interested in the object, but it's also the case that when the child holds an object, they hold it more stably, okay? Um, they, and they, they hold it longer, they hold their head stiller, okay? So holding behavior stills the head and holding behavior lasts in a longer period to which the held object is foregrounded relative to competitors. The other thing is that holding behavior um, stabilizes the gaze in the center of the uh, head-centered view, all of which may be important. This goes back to that point about we have the high-level information. It's an object the child is interested in, but there's the low-level information, the contrast and being the, the visual size, which is the... Uh, uh, spatial frequency, low spatial frequency of the visual information and being centered in the field of view. These are creating, I think, what are signature properties, the child's own body for what makes visual learning for all of us easier or harder, okay? The other things you should note is that when babies are holding these objects for these periods and keeping them foregrounded, they are not holding them still. They may be holding their head still and they may be holding their hands in the center of the body, but they are changing their views of the objects. This everyday learning is not like looking at a picture, okay? They are actively generating information about the object. And we know that the views they generate are biased, okay? This heat map is a little um, hard to understand if you don't think about it, but let me just note a few things for you. So we, these are, we have babies handling objects. And this is over here is a heat map of all the views that they are showing themselves, okay? And without even knowing what the views are, you can see that there's hot spots, okay? In the one-year-old views, they're not as bright as they are in the two-and-a-half-year-old views, right? But the same hot spots are there all the way through. What are those hot spots? Those hot spots are what are called the planar views of objects. I show them, let me go back here. Go back, okay. I show them down here at the bottom. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. I'm down here at the bottom. Um, where I'm showing the train there, they're called um, planar views. They're views in which the axis of elongation or the axis of symmetry is either perpendicular or parallel to the line of sight. 
And what babies are doing preferentially, I'll pick up my little scissors here. I don't know if you can see me or not. I can't see me, so I don't know. But they, um, they hold the objects. So they're mostly, you know, a flat, straight on view like this or like this. And then what they do is they rotate them in depth. This provides a huge amount of visual information about that individual object, okay? All right, and they get better with age. They are certainly getting more biased with age. However, we know these biases now are visual biases. They are not uh, due to the hands exploring objects and how to rotate them. In one study, we gave uh, babies, the uh, uh, children, uh, same age as in the, as in the original uh, Journal of Vision paper, we gave them objects to explore that were novel, and we either gave them to them to hand like handle like regular objects, or we put them in uh, clear plastic spheres. And the reason for putting them in plastic spheres is that what you do with the hands is equipotential for any view, okay? So if the biases that we'd observed in the original study were due to um, handling of objects, right? Not the visual information per se, um, this should, those biases should go away. But what we found instead is the biases were much, much stronger when the objects were in spheres and that one-year-old generations begin to look more like two and a half-year-old generated views. Actually, the hands appear to be getting in the way of what were, uh, what are visual biases, okay? Um, bi visual biases to look at objects rotating in depth and to look at objects um, that concentrate or dwell on and around the planar views. We're collecting a study right now, or we were before COVID shut us down, where we are presenting six month old infants with um, views that were generated by uh, two and a half and three year olds their views that uh, dwell on the planar. This is a real child. This was generated by a real 36 month old, but rendered um, in uh, 3D here. And, or we present them with images that were generated by a one year old, which show less planar views. And the um, young baby six month olds prefer to look at the older views, the views that were generated by older babies and that are biased towards planar views. Suggesting again, that this is really a visual bias that's in the system. The system likes this information. We also know from several studies that the variability of these self-generated views predicts learning, um, memory, and generalization of object names. Um, so in one study, we showed that children who generated more variable views, that's the one led by Lauren Sloan, that children who generated more variable views led, uh, had higher object name vocabularies than those who did not explore objects so robustly. And in a second study, um, we actually gave um, a deep learning network, standard kind of CNNs, we gave them either infant generated views, toddler generated views of objects, these kind of variable uh, centered on planar views, or we gave them adult generated views of the same objects during play, okay, but the adults were playing with the infant, so they didn't generate very interesting views, or we gave the network uh, training on um, image net kind of images. And what we found was that the baby's views were better. Okay, baby's views led to more robust learning and more robust generalization, um, suggesting that the information, even for just regular old CNN, you know, networks that are not probably even perfectly like our visual system, that the information in the baby generated views may be optimal, even for generalized learning systems. All right, so this is uh, the hands on objects niche. And what the, the summary point that I want to make here is toddlers with their active interest in handling objects and exploring them create a data set for learning about visual objects that may well be optimal in terms of low level information, high visibility, and also in terms of the range of variability which they generate to themselves. Okay. 
And this is a period, this is a data set that's specific to this period, okay? It's not five month old infants, don't do any of this. All right, my final highlight, okay, is, and I'll do this pretty quickly, is that everywhere in looking at the home view data, it has become very clear that uh, what we have at every level you think about the problem is massive experience with a few individual things and rarer experiences with many things. So if you look at the frequency of objects in a home, what you see are the frequency of visual experiences, you're going to see that a few things are very, very frequent and most things are infrequent. That is the data for learning in the world is not normal distributed, it is not randomly distributed, it is not uniformly distributed, yet all of our experiments seem to assume at least one of these kinds of distributions. So I just want to really quickly, before I conclude, uh, not keep us too long, is tell you that this is true for just about everything you want to look at, and I'll begin with individual faces. So I told you that the infant's faces early on, they have, see, a lot more faces a lot more faces in the images than older infants. But for all the infants in the US, up to 12 months of age, just three faces count for most of the data. You can account for close to 100% of all the faces seen by three month olds in the US with just three faces. And, and for the US babies at 12 months, you can account for 80% of the faces with about three faces, mom, dad, grandma, mom, dad, and little brother. You see the same pattern in India. We're just now finishing up these analyses, but the same pattern is there in India for the younger infants. Although the number of unique faces increases markedly for older infants for 12 month olds as they begin to spend time um, on the street. So what you have early on is experience that's massive, both here and in the, in the village in India, early experience is massive with respect to a few faces. Think about this for a minute. We become expert at learning and discriminating any face we can encounter by first becoming expert about a very few faces. The experience expected stimulus for early visual experience for during the period of the sensitive period is unique, is a few unique faces. Okay, that are highly frequent and close up frontal views. Okay. This uh, kind of uh, this skewed frequency distribution is also characteristic of individual objects. And this is a project we're working on right now. But if you, what I'm showing here are just some, if you, some of the images from what one 13 month old infant saw of cups, okay? And this infant is one who contributed, he really did a nice long day, contributed seven hours, okay? And 40% of that infant's cup experience, 40%, sorry. 40% <laughs> of those seven hours of images, okay? 40% of that child's day had one specific sippy cup in view, this green sippy cup here. This child, and anybody who's a parent of a toddler would, would expect the same, this child is an expert, I would imagine, in recognizing and finding that sippy cup in any kind of visual context. 40% of his images in one day contained one individual object, the sippy cup, upside down, in clutter, far away, near being held on the floor under the blanket. Now, this is a really different way from the way uh, machine learning thinks about teaching us anything, right? If you were going to teach a child about cups, right, you would think you need to show him, as we're showing on the side, sort of typical experimental stimuli, a whole variety of cups of different colors and maybe slightly different positions with and without handles, right? But this baby is mostly seeing one cup and maybe a few others, okay? But one, the, the number of oil will be just a few cups, the cups that are in the house, just like the faces, that this is going to dominate the cup category for this baby. Okay, finally, 
got a common, these, you see these same frequency distributions for common categories. And now to make this point, I wanna talk about eight to 10 month olds. They're a really interesting group of, of infants in the middle here. Um, infants between eight and 10 month olds are, um, they're working on a lot of stuff. They really wanna sit stably. They like to manipulate objects. Uh, they really wanna stand up and they are not good at it. These are the children who, um, when they are sitting playing with a toy, if they lean over, if they reach for something, they fall over, okay? These are the children who, when they start to try to use a spoon, poke their eye out, okay? They are like not really good at any of this, but they're working on it, okay? They also do not talk yet, but they receptively know a few object names, and that is very interesting. They already know some object names. Receptively, we know this because a number of studies have now shown that babies this age in experiments will look preferentially to named objects like banana or a cup or shoe, okay? So they are learning object names. All right, whoops. So. What I wanna do is uh, tell you about some evidence that we've been working on. This is with my student, uh, Elizabeth Glarkin, in which we um, are, have been analyzing um, the visual objects in mealtimes. And the reason why we chose mealtimes is what to look at in the home view data is that the babies eat five times a day, okay? And we defined these so-called meal times as any time there were food or dishes present. So you, you shouldn't think that they're just sitting at a table, right? These are Cheerios. These are Cheerios on the floor, okay? These are more Cheerios, okay? Um, there's a bottle there, okay? So that counts as, or a sippy cup. So that counts as meal time. Anything involving food or dishes counts as a meal time, okay? And, when you look at the scenes of these eight to 10 month olds, they are not like the scenes you see from um, the uh, 12 and 18 month olds, which are really well organized by objects being handled and instrumental acts. The scenes of eight to 10 month olds are cluttered, okay? You should note that when you see a baby in these scenes, it's not the baby wearing the head camera. That was a, whoops, that was a child at, go back here. That was a child at play group. Okay, so that's just a foot of another child. Um, but they're very, these images contain many, many different unique objects, all of which are nameable. So it's like the classic case of referential ambiguity if you were trying to think about how they are, learn object names, okay? But what we found in this work is that in these cluttered scenes, some object categories are very, very frequent. And most object categories, most of the things in these scenes occur rarely. So scene after scene at mealtime, you will see cups. Scene after scene at mealtimes, you will see the table. Scene after scene at mealtimes, you will see um, a spoon, okay? Scene after scene, you'll see a phone. That's because everybody has an iPhone on the table, right? So most of these early pervasive objects are actually correspond to the first nouns that babies learn, suggesting that the visual pervasiveness of these categories of the early of the that the highly frequent visual categories, even before babies are talking, are somehow laying the foundation for object name learning. So why, how could they be doing that? What role could the vision side being played? Well, Extended visual experiences with individual objects may make you resistance to the problem of clutter when you have to uh, map a name to those objects. Seeing that sippy cup or seeing spoons in general in lots and lots and lots of different visual contexts is gonna help you segment it, help you find the object and the object category in clutter is likely to build very strong visual memories. It may make attaching a name to those memories easy. Um, and in these ways may in some way support the kind of one shot category learning where you can go from a tractor to any tractor because you have deep knowledge about individual objects and individual object categories. So I don't have the answer to how it is that these things yet contribute to uh, one-shot learning of categories like tractor by the time a child is two years of age. 
But I think the secret sauce might be in there becoming visual experts on individual objects early and becoming visual experts on just a few categories early and that these play a role in the rapid learning of object names. So I began coming to the end here. I began, um, and I'm sorry I went over, that learning depends on both the learning machinery and the training data. Um, and that argued that we really need to understand the training data if we're gonna understand the machinery. And I think it really does have implications for machinery. Right now, machine learning, which is, has had many strengths, but has some problems as well, really operates by using massive batches of data. The data is all labeled. You know, you have to know what it is that has to be learned before you can train it. And really they mostly work by finding boundaries, okay? By finding category boundaries around the labeling of the data. Children's learning doesn't look like that at all. They become experts about a few things first. They don't have massive instances of experiences. They get a curriculum of training, expertise in one thing, and then they build upon that by building expertise in another, moving on. Babies self-generate their data, and throughout it all, they have internal biases and abilities that are really shaping and selecting the data for learning so that the data for learning has a structure and likely a structure that matches the internal learning abilities. All right, so I began by saying any theory uh, worth its salt should have something to say about how infants learn all they do. I think that is true. And I think the way we're gonna figure this out is by looking at the data and how the infant's own data for learning and how the infant's own activity creates the training data and how it changes with age, okay? And so with that, I will conclude. Uh, these are pictures of my uh, lab, my current members of my lab at time, but um, through the years, there's been a number of people um, who have contributed to, uh, to this work. Some of them are named on the side, okay? Thank you very much.